heard someone whistling that last song. So for our scripture reading today, we're going to read four entire books of the Bible. You think I'm kidding? <laughs> I am kidding. I wish I could read Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah, just as a starting point for what we're going to talk about. Those books have so much in common. They deal with the same theme. Our, our biggest focus will be on the book of Haggai. It's going to be on the screen. It might be overwhelming, all the, the words flying by. If you have your Bible, you might be able to go at your own pace more and come back and read. I encourage you, if you need a Bible, there's Bibles at the back. But I'm going to read the book of Haggai, most of the book. I'm going to skip just a few verses, but we're going to read all of chapter 1 and most of chapter 2. And I'm going to pray that this message God's laid on my heart doesn't get hindered by my words, by my thinking, that we just speak truth and we receive it. This is Haggai chapter 1, starting verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men, on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. Then into chapter 2. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of, the high, of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is it not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted 
with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Skip to verse 15. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days, when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, and from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, says the Lord, and will make you a, like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. I risk a lot by reading a lot, but there's got to be context to what we talk about today. And I hope as, as I pour a lot of this out, what we read will, will start to click. Haggai, that, this is such a tiny book, just two chapters, but it is linked with a larger story. He is linked. And so is the book that follows him, the prophet Zechariah that follows him. These two men, among others, had such influence upon the, the children of Israel during this time. This is when the, after 70 years of captivity, when Nebuchadnezzar came and took, took away the Israelites captive to Babylon, now 70 years has gone by and Cyrus, king, has made a decree that the Jews can return and they can rebuild Jerusalem. They can rebuild the temple. God moved upon Cyrus's heart. This is during this time and Haggai, probably among those who, who came, there was different waves of people coming back to Jerusalem out of captivity. He was probably among the first there. And here we have Joshua, the son of the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And they are there, and they hear the word of the Lord to rebuild the temple. But the enemies of God hated that idea. They did not want this people of God, the Israelites, whom they have, who they had heard of and, and read about, all the victories that the God of Israel had given them and how they were rescued out of Egypt and how God gave them the land of promise and victory after victory. They did not want the people of Israel to get strong again. And so they stirred up the king at that time, King Ahasuerus. And they said, oh, king, these Jews, they're, they're building a wicked city. They're going to up be be uprooting everything about our lives. They're going to be rebelling against you, O king. We need to stop it. And they succeeded in stopping the work. The temple had started to be rebuilt, but they stopped it. And it stopped for a period of about 14 years. And the enemies of God were rejoicing. If you look to the book of Ezra, 
Ezra speaks about this time. And he writes, the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Then in chapter 5 of Ezra, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edi, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. This guy, Haggai, and along with him, Zechariah, they're so influential. The work stopped. The enemy reared his ugly head. Good and wonderful things were happening. The people were starting to return to where God had told them that is where they would be. And now they're starting to rebuild the temple, a place to offer worship to God, the house of God. And they hated that. And so they stopped them. They threatened them. First they said, let us come and help build with you. We'll help you. Of course, what they were going to do is they were going to sabotage the work. But that, did, that scheme didn't play out. So then they went all the way to the top. And they said, King, you've got to stop this. And he stopped it. Well, God taps on his prophets and said, You tell the people, don't fear them. You go and do my work. Build my house. And so he speaks to the people. And the people listen, especially Zerubbabel and Joshua. Their hearts are particularly gripped by the prophet's words. And they go and they proclaim, and the people have one heart. It's, it's not just those two men that were excited. It says the remnant of the people. God has a remnant. God has people who hear his voice in all ages, no matter what the culture is doing, no matter how dark things get in our society. There is always a remnant. There is always those who believe. That Jesus is Lord of all. That God sent his son because he loved us so much and he died for us so that we could be saved from our sin. There is a remnant and that remnant is the church of the living God. All who put faith in Jesus, that is God's church. Every believer. We're going to see a transition from the old covenant to the new in our text. Again, I know this is a lot of reading. But look, look at our main text now. Verses 6 through 9. Haggai chapter 2. I'm going to read these one more time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and, and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of, of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. What is this all about? What is, what is this message not just to the people of God at this time, but what is it to us right now? We're speaking about the glory of the Lord. The prophet says, the glory of this temple that you're in right now, the one that's being rebuilt, and if you, even if you think back to Solomon's temple, the original temple, the one that Solomon built with all his glory, there's another temple coming. That's going to be so far beyond the glory of these. You won't even believe the glory that's coming. What is that glory of a latter temple? Well, there was glory in the first temple. There was great glory to be seen and experienced in the temple that Solomon built and in the one that was being rebuilt. God raised up David's son, Solomon, to be king over his people. And he called Solomon to build him a house. Build the house of the Lord. Remember, David wanted to do it. 
But God said, it's not for you. You shed much blood. It'll be your son who builds the house for me. And, and God raised Solomon up. And he didn't, didn't just raise him up as king. He was given the most wisdom of any man, the most power and wealth and fame. God raised up a man to build him a glorious house. And Solomon took all his kingdom, all of his influence, and poured it in to furnishing the temple. It was furnished with the finest and most, most precious materials, especially gold. Gold over everything, the altar, the lampstands, all the furnishings, the tables for the showbread, the doors, the beams, the pillars, everything overlaid with gold. And everything, the walls, the beams, decorated with precious jewels. And God said to, to commission artisans, artists to go and, and carve incredible works of art. It was beautiful. It was amazing. And then in, there in the place, the most holy place, was the Ark of the Covenant, the place symbolizing where God dwelt among his people. The Ark overlaid with gold, overshadowed by the, the, the cherubim covered in gold, the wings that covered over the Ark. There, the mercy seat where God dwelt. All of it was splendor and glory. And just to look at that temple, if we, if we could see that original temple of Solomon, we'd be blown away at its majesty, its sparkle, its beauty. But the glory wasn't about the building. In fact, right after the temple is finished being built, we read in 2 Chronicles, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endures forever. As, as amazing as that glorious temple was, it was nothing compared to the moment when Solomon prayed, Now fill this place. And God filled it with his glory. And it was so powerful that only God's glory could remain there and fire and smoke. Talk about glory. That's the first temple. Isaiah spoke about this. He saw in a vision the Lord high and lifted up, and he saw the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and the angels cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There's so many accounts that speak about the glory of God being revealed in that first temple. And here, the people of God are called to rebuild the temple. But aren't you glad God was never worried about buildings and artwork and temples made by men's hands? It was never intended when God told them to build a temple that that is what they should worship or how they should wor worship even. It was to prepare them to teach them about God's holiness, his beauty, and that one day there would be a temple made without hands that would reveal the full glory of the Almighty. What was that temple? Jesus would be the one who brought the glory of this latter house. Oh, there's so much to say here. I, you tackle four books. You try to fit that into 30 minutes. Good luck. Jesus was walking around there, and people were saying, look at this temple, look at how beautiful this temple is. And Jesus said, you see this temple? I tell you, not one stone of it is going to be left 
It's going to be destroyed. If God sets up a kingdom that lasts forever, that endures through all time because he is eternal, if God's glory could only reside in a temple made by men's hands or a building made by men's hands, then when that temple was destroyed, there goes the glory of God, right? The glory of God was never about temples. The glory of God was never about ritualistic traditions and, and the formalities of religion. He has given us commandments. He has given us ordinances to teach us about spiritual truths. But the physical signs, the physical elements, it was never about that being the glory. The glory is that God became one of us. God took upon himself our flesh. And the glory of God was revealed in the body that was prepared for his son, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ entered into the temple, it says that he cleared out, he drove out the money changers. He drove out those who sold doves and who were making profit in the house of God. And zeal for the house of God consumed him. And the glory of the Lord entered in. And there was delivered, as the prophet says, peace. The prince of peace. That temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. But the temple that the prophet is speaking of here is an eternal one. I love this phrase, the, the desire of all nations. What is the desire of all nations? Rather, who is the desire of all nations? The Son of God, Jesus. Once more, it's a little while. Haggai, there's going to be hundreds of years that has to progress here. But soon, I'm going to shake heaven. I'm going to shake earth. And the people, my people, will come to the desire of all nations. Translation, I will come to them. And I will fill this temple with glory. The, the temples, there's no glory in the temple. The glory is the one who fills the temple. And the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. Jesus said, he was talking about how this generation that he was speaking to had rejected the truth and he said the queen of the south the queen of sheba will rise up in the day of judgment and she will judge this generation she came from the ends of the earth to fall down and to give glory and honor to solomon but jesus says i tell you the truth one greater than solomon is here you think the glory of solomon was something I am the Messiah. I am God in the flesh. But you've rejected me and you've left your house. Your house has left you desolate. You see, the glory of God was, was fully revealed bodily in the person of Jesus Christ. But there's more to this prophecy about this latter glory being greater than the first of the temple. Do you realize that the desire of nations, Jesus, is said to reside in the heart of every believer? That scripture tells us that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are now the house of God. You are the temple of the living God. Do you know what this latter glory is, is really speaking of? Yes, it's speaking about Jesus Christ, but not just Christ come to man, not just Christ revealed as God Almighty, Emmanuel, as we just sang. It's Christ in us. That is the glory. The church of the living God, that is the climax of this prophecy this is 
the truth of the gospel throughout all ages, that God now has come to dwell not in a temple made with hands, but with you and with me. You are now the temple of God. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This is what I'm working for, Paul says. This is what it's all about. This is what the prophets spoke about. Moses' writings, everything brings to this point. This is the takeaway, Paul says. The glory is in Jesus revealed in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Jesus entered the synagogue, I, I've read this so many times in so many sermons, but I'm drawn to Luke chapter 4 over and over, verses 18 to 21. Jesus was handed the, the scroll. It was his turn to read, and it was the book of Isaiah. And he read from the book of Isaiah, fulfilling the prophecy about himself. He read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, the glory of God had come to man, the desire of nations. Jesus said, the prophecy about the Messiah, the one who would set prisoners free, the one that would, would come and, and conquer the enemies, heal the brokenhearted, give sight to the blind, that's me, and I'm here. All nations will be drawn to me, and I, if I am lifted up, if I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Praise God. The desire of nations has come. What, are, what is every nation, what is every man, woman desire? At the very core, every human desires to have that hole that God has created in our heart, that eternity to be realized. We were created to know our maker. We were created to see a God who is glorious and mighty and loving and forgiving and holy and just and righteous. We were created to know him, but we've rebelled. We've run away from him. And so many are still running away in their sin and rebellion. And their house, their temple, does not have the glory of God residing in it. The prophet came to the people who had stopped the work because the enemies pushed hard. The enemy said, this is not going to work. You need to stop. It's not time to do what God has called you to do. And they threatened him and they stopped. And Haggai comes to them and so does Zechariah. And he says, what are you doing? Get back to work. Build the house of the Lord. It is time if there's anyone here who has neglected the house, neglected your life, neglected the very temple that God wishes to dwell in, you. If you have neglected to prepare your house for the coming of the Lord, it is time to rebuild. It is time to get right with God. Some, some have started out just like the people did there. They first left out of captivity. They came back and they started working. It said they, they started building the altar. They started with the altar and they started worshiping God. And then they started building the temple around it. That's awesome. First things first, let's worship God. Everything was going great. But then turmoil, then trials, then the fires of temptations of life hit. And the work was stopped out of fear. 
is that you? God says, right now, I want to dwell with you. Prepare yourself. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about prepare yourself to meet your God. Prepare yourself to be filled with the glory of God. This is the intent through all the ages. Yeah, this building is great because it keeps us warm and it's, it's pleasant to look at. But this building is not the church. This building could burn down in a second. The church doesn't go away. The people of God. That is the church. And the church is triumphant throughout all ages. The church, when Jesus ascended to heaven, his, his church was commissioned. His disciples went out, go into all the nations. Remember, he's the desire of all nations. You go into all the nations and you tell them about me. You make disciples, you baptize them, you teach them all that I taught you. And I'm going to be with you forever. And I'm coming again. The church was born. And from that moment on, we have been experiencing this greater glory. It was never about golden pillars and, and holy, the holy place and the most holy place. It was always about him. It was always about Christ. The wonderful Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Christmas, we've been talking about the promise of the Messiah, God coming and fulfilling all of those prophecies. Let me read just a few more prophecies at the risk of reading too much more. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to have you put a couple more verses up there. This, this is from Zechariah, the next book. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20. Again, this is this prophet at the same time with Haggai, the Lord moving these two godly men to speak to the people. Zechariah says, thus says the Lord of hosts, people sh shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. And thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now this is speaking to the Jews, but Zechariah is speaking prophetically of this latter glory. He is not just speaking about the Jewish nation. He is speaking about the true followers of God. He is speaking of the church, the new Jerusalem coming down. This is all those who are saved, those who by faith in Jesus Christ are washed in the blood of the Lamb. He says... There will be people from all nations coming to you, church, coming to you, Christian, saying, I want to go with you to the house of God. Where is I want to go with you. Let's go. Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is the, this is the glory of the gospel that Jesus, yes, he has revealed himself to all mankind. But his intent was to reveal himself to everyone through you and me. We are to be his messengers. And the glory of God is to be seen in us. Church. Are you a part of the church? I don't mean just a group of people who meet on a Sunday morning. I mean, are you truly believing in Jesus Christ? If so, you are called to bring the glory of God to all the nations. You have in your heart of hearts the desire of all nations. And men is going, God is going to stir the hearts of men all around us. And say, i got to have what you have. Already I see that happening in my friend Josh's life. People who have known Josh 
his whole life are seeing something different. They're seeing something new in him. And they want what he has. That's the glory of God filling the temple of Josh, the house of God. This is what we've been talking about this whole month in particular, about the incarnation of God. God with us. Yes, he has come with us, but he dwells in the hearts of everyone who puts faith in him. I love, this is uh, lyrics from my favorite artist, Neil Morris. This is a lyrics from one of his songs. He says, Speaking of this greater temple, from a list of laws, seeing all our flaws, to the blind, the lame, we are all the same. Our high priest has come to make us all as one in him. The temple of his throne is now not made with stone. Your very heart is now his home. He will come and live if you'll only give him a place inside that the world can't buy. And the holy place is now face to face in Christ. When he died and was born, the temple walls were torn and God's spirit poured out to all the ones without. Now the temple of the living God is you. The temple of the living God is you. That's is what everything this gospel preaches, the entire message of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is about this hope of glory, Christ in you. Are you saved? Or are you stuck with a, a broken pile of ruined rubble, a house that is not giving glory to God, a house that refuses to hear the call of the Spirit, come, come to me, let's reason together. Don't resist me anymore. Don't listen to the fear of the enemy. Don't listen to their threats. I am for you. Come, let's reason together. Oh, God wants to fill your life with his glory, with his peace. Our text says, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. The only way we have peace is for Christ, the Prince of Peace. To, that his peace dwells within us. And his glory fills us. Every Sunday morning, my brother... Bob comes in. I get here really early. He comes a little later, and he prays with me. And he prayed something this morning. He just said this line. He says, Lord, you have decorated my life. And that stood out to me. The temple that Solomon built, the temple that God had recommissioned here, it was decorated with beautiful things, beautiful, precious materials but it's nothing compared to the precious jewels that are that are on the crown of the righteous to to a man or a woman who simply says i need you god would you accept me i confess i need you i need to be saved to the one who comes in simple faith, God promises he will never cast out. He will never put to shame. And he says, this one, in this one, I will be pleased to dwell. And he comes into that life, and that life is made new. A new heart, a new creature, new creation. I almost forgot to read this. Acts chapter 17. Paul was in a place... He was in a temple uh, of the Greeks, and, and it was just a statue for this god, that god, every god. Polytheism to the max. They even had a, st a statue to an unknown god, just in case they missed one. And Paul says, the unknown god is the one I'm going to tell you about. He is the god of all. And this is what he tells them. 
God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. Now, there's too much to be said. When the glory of the Lord filled that earthly temple, the people couldn't bear it. It was too much. But now, as Paul says, that glory comes to us and says, I will be found by you when you seek me. When you grope and seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. And Jesus says, I will come in. You open your door, I will come in and I will sup with you. I will dine with you. I will dwell with you. It is not untouchable to be saved. It is not untouchable to have all the promises of God at work in your life. But you have to accept it by faith. You've got to surrender. Are you, this morning, the temple of the living God or not? Don, would you come? I'm going to sing that chorus, Emmanuel. You saw it? No, I'll just sing the chorus. So sing with me, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us forever. Emmanuel, Savior of the world. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. One more time. Emmanuel, God with us forever. Emmanuel. Savior of the world, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Respond to God today. Don't, don't push him off for another second. <clears throat> Amen. Oh, thank you, brother. Uh, I, I no, love how scripture in the Old Testament so often has two a doublet in, uh, in fulfilling prophecy. Many examples. I'm not going to go through any of them right now, but this, this three or four popped in my head. It, it's, it, but this is another one of those. These people are looking at the temple they just built. Oh, no, they laid the foundation. And the old ones who are before the captivity, so they've got to be... I don't know, 80 years old, they looked at it and they wept because they saw the former temple. But the young ones rejoiced when they saw the temple was being rebuilt again, while some wept. And then they said, you who saw the former glory, what do you think of it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? I'm telling you, the latter temple will be greater. I love how my brother brought out the ultimate of that prophecy was what the New Testament is all about. You are that spiritual house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are living stones being built up into the spiritual temple. I love how he brought that out. But there's also this nice little doublet in there. And that is the temple that they made had greater glory in it than Solomon's. And that was spectacular. It was so amazing that Herod spent 46 years trying to beautify the temple because he wanted it to be beautiful because it's they didn't understand the spiritual nature that God was talking about. And he said, the, the glory of the later temple, it's going to be greater. So 
Hair is making the people happy, decorating it, trying to make it as beautiful as he can. He couldn't even get close to the wealth that Solomon lavished on. He couldn't even get it close to it. How is it going to be greater glory? But one day, greater glory came into that very temple they built that it seemed like nothing in their eyes. And as a little baby, eight days old, was brought into the temple. Who had been waiting was promised he would see the salvation of God before he would die. And he came there that day and he took Jesus in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared before the face of all peoples. This is it. To pick up Jesus is to hold salvation. Now you are letting me depart in peace. And that very prophecy that Jim started us off on, it's quoted in the New Testament. And it says, quoting from Haggai, now this, I'm sorry, whose voice then shook the earth, but he is now promising, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken as of those things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. What's it saying? It's saying what God was talking about was something that's never going to pass away, never be shaken. Oh, you can be a beautiful woman, but you know what? You're going to be shaken, and the building's going to start getting wrinkles. And you know, you can be a strong man, but pretty soon you're going to stoop over, and going up ladders on high on roofs is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Everything that can be shaken in your world is going to be shaken. Everything in this world, this planet is going to be shaken. Even it's going to perish, the Bible says. But we are receiving a kingdom. We are becoming a temple that can never be shaken. The satisfaction, the joy, he is the desire of everyone in every nation, whether they know it or not. One day all will know it. For some, it'll be too late. But praise God, you can know it now. You can find that which cannot be shaken, which renews day by day. I thank God I found it. I thank God many people I know have found it. And I will thank God if anyone here finds it. Would you stand? Oh, Lord, it's so obvious your whole word of God, even as Jesus said, was written to testify of him. This is your plan from before you ever said, let there be light, that you would become a part of your creation, that we might become like your son, the children of God. Thank you for this word today. Thank you that Christmas is still going on because God is still with us, Emmanuel. Lord, would you just give, Lord, in your mercy and your love, no rest to anyone that tries to rest upon a foundation that's only going to crumble and be shaken away. Let each life Find the purpose for which you created us. In Jesus' name.